All right, let's talk content. Um, so where we left off yesterday was we had this nice definition for work, the way that we're going to uh, be utilizing it here in General Chemistry 150. Uh, specifically, as a reminder, this is work uh, done by a gaseous system. So this is uh, PV work or uh, P delta V work. Um, if you take higher order chemistry courses, what you'll find is that there's going to be situations where you're going to hold the volume of a container constant, but you're going to change the pressure. Um, if you do that, this definition that's on the screen right now isn't applicable anymore. Um, so, and things get a lot more complicated. You start needing to use calculus and jazz like that. Uh, we're not doing that in this course, we're focusing just on this definition of work where we're changing volume, but we're keeping uh, external pressure constant. And that P there that in this equation is for external pressure. A um, couple of notes about delta V. Delta V is going to be positive if a gas is expanding. That kind of makes sense because if a gas is expanding, its final position is going to be larger than its initial position. And so if you go back to that equation that we talked about last time where change in volume is final minus initial volumes, then yeah, delta V should be positive um, if the gas is expanding. If the gas is expanding that way, then work, our value of work is going to have a negative. So we are going to have negative work. If you see a negative work value, that tells you whether the gas is expanding or not. Um, so sometimes you are going to read a problem and we're going to do practice problems um, at infinitum tomorrow. And uh, I think our earlier discussion day is Thursday. Uh, we're going to do, I'm going to be doing practice problems. Um, that expanded is going to tell you whether you need a negative sign in front of work or a positive sign. Um, a negative sign, what that means not in the language of mathematics, what it means in the real world is that our system is losing energy. So energy is being transferred from the system to the surroundings if we have a negative work value. Just said that. If delta V is negative, now we have a situation where the final volume is smaller than our initial volume. If you think back to that uh, image we had yesterday, I'm going to scroll real quick back to that. Bam, there it is. So this is an example where our final volume, the one in the middle, is less than our initial volume. So we are compressing the gas. Th this is going to be a, a chapter where you're going to have to break out your thesaurus as to uh, expansion, compression, work done on, work done by, things like terminology like that. Um, the thesaurus, your thesaurus is your best friend for helping parsing out the language. So, wow, I went really far back. So if delta V is negative, our gas is compressed. The positive quantity that that is going to lead to is meaning then that our system is gaining energy. So the system, is, or I'm sorry, the surroundings are pushing in on to the system and then the system is going to be gaining energy from the surroundings. So if we go back to that uh, concept of internal energy, you remember how I said I was going to be using U most of the time, um, and your book uses E. Uh, so for your internal energy of your system, um, you're not going to be able to like stick any kind of probe, per se, into a thing and say, yep, that is going to be the internal energy of our system. It just, it's it doesn't work like that um, in the large portion because we can't uh, accurately account for all the different kinds of energy that are within a system so if you remember from last time we had that different kinds of molecular motion we had different uh, kinds of uh, electrostatic interactions we had the kinds of interactions that hope hold protons and neutrons together you're not going to stick one probe into a sample and get all that information out 
But the good news for us about measuring internal energy of a system is it's what we call a state function. Um, state functions are incredibly useful. The definition of a state function is that um, the value of a thing is only dependent upon the initial and then the present or final state of a system. So it's not really mattering how you go from the initial, trying to make sure I've got my hands actually on the camera. It doesn't matter how you go from here to here. You can take a straight line, you can take a curvy line, what have you. Um, all that matters is the, dis the distance between these two points. Um, and so this state function is a uh, concept that we're going to use fairly regularly here in the thermodynamics chapter because we're going to have something, we're going to have things like internal energy that we won't be able to measure directly, but because we can measure initial and final states of our system, that's all we'll need in order to figure out the change in the internal energy. Again, it does not matter if you were dealing with a uh, time, trying to take a measurement or trying to figure out a numeric value of something uh, that is a state function, how it gets there. It's just, where was it? Where is it? It's the ultimate in utilitarianism, um, if you've had your philosophy classes yet. Importantly, importantly, heat and work are not state functions. So it, if we are taking a measurement of something that is heated, if we are taking a measurement of work, especially that uh, work done by a gas, um, those are very dependent upon how things get accomplished. Um, the process and the individual uh, points along the way between the initial and the final will matter for heat and for work. They are not state functions, but something like internal energy is. So to help articulate the difference here, um, or to help articulate a state function and what that means, uh, let's talk about the example of climbing a mountain. All right. So yes, this is my really, really horrible attempt at trying to draw something in PowerPoint. Uh, thank you very much, chat, for not roasting me completely for this horrible drawing. So we've got a uh, little dude here on the left, the red person. We have a uh, little dude on the right, the purple person. Um, and we have in the middle a mountain. So that's what we're going to call that blue triangle. We're going to call it a mountain. Now, if you have ever climbed a mountain, there's usually a couple ways of climbing a mountain. Um, you can either take the trail that's designed for said mountain, um, and sometimes for different mountains, there's different kinds of trails. There's the ones who are more aggressive, um, and there's the ones that are more leisurely. Um, or you can just go off the trail and just climb straight up. So if we take a look here at our two little people as they climb the mountain. All right, just because I spent time on that animation, I'm going to show it again. If we take a look at our two people here as they climb the mountain, the purple person arrived to the top of the mountain first. Um, but at the end of the day, both the red person and the purple person showed up at the exact same point of the mountain. So they started at the base of the mountain and they ended up at the top. Even though they took drastically different ways to get there um, and they took different amounts of time to get there doesn't matter for a state function a state function really is just saying where were you where's your initial and then where'd you end up where's your final so climbing a mountain is completely a state function um, in that regard in terms of that change in height right now like i said time is different uh, so time is not a state function but your height difference uh, between where you're starting and where you're ending, that would be. And that's the same kind of thing that internal energy is. See, they change the same height. Look at those arrows. Ah, oh, so cute. Pinch your little cheeks. 
can't you just wait for an entire semester of comments like that? It's going to be a good time. Okay. Um, let's talk about the law of conservation of energy. Again, I apologize that we're doing a lot of definitions up front, but without these definitions, um, we're just not going to get any of the actual problems done right. So we're front loading with definitions and then we're going to practice once we've got those definitions down. Um, so my ask for you today is today, after today's lecture, um, try your best to identify what the key definitions are, start working on those definitions so that you can get them down pat um, so that when we work problems, we're not going to have to be looking up definitions as well as practicing the problems. We're going to be able to just start working on how to input the information into the equations and whatnot, right? So my ask is get your definitions down from this lecture, get your definitions down from the last lecture, and we'll go from there. So is it possible to measure the difference in internal energy between two states of a system? Because I've said, like with that mountain example, if we know the final, we know the initial, we can figure out the change in height. Well, if we're going to figure out the internal er change in internal energy of a system, we have to be able to figure out what the internal energy is at the beginning at the end. Um, and we said that it's pretty hard to measure that explicitly for a system. So this is where the law of conservation of energy is going to come into play. So what it is telling us is that for our physical or chemical changes, energy is going to get exchanged between a system and its surroundings, but energy is not going to be created or destroyed. So that part's really important. We're going to exchange between system and surroundings, but we're not going to be creating new energy in a chemical change, and we're not going to be destroying energy in a chemical change. Uh, same thing for our physical process. Um, and we're going to, if you're in Chem 151 lab, you're going to have uh, an example of a uh, physical process uh, that we're going to be monitoring, namely the uh, dissolving of solids um, in water, which I know I made that sound super exciting, but it actually is kind of cool. So while it might be really hard to measure um, the exact amount of energy that a system has, what we can do is we can usually account for, if we set our experiment up right, we have to set the experiment up right. What we usually can do is account for the energy exchange uh, between the system and the surroundings. Um, and if we can account for that energy change that's happening between the system and in the surroundings, then we can say, oh, well, here's how much energy was exchanged. Cool. I know from the law of conservation of energy, this is roughly then the energy change that her that happened, the internal energy change that happened with our system. So how can energy get exchanged between the system and the surroundings? Well, here's where our definition of heat and work come into play. So we're going to be setting up experiments specifically so that we can exchange energy bet uh, between the system and the surroundings in the form of heat and in the form of work. Or if we're really clever, if we're really clever, we're gonna try to set up these experiments so that energy exchange is only gonna happen because of heat or because of work. So yeah, both of these could happen, and then sometimes they both will happen, and we'll have to account for that. But if, it's, if we use our brains in the lab, um, there's a lot of times where we can just say, nope, I only have to measure one of these because I've negated any kind of energy exchange happening due to the other one. This gives us this understanding then of if the energy is gonna be exchanged only via heat and via work, the change in internal energy that U or E in your textbook, that change in internal energy is going to be equal to Q plus W. Q 
plus W. Heat plus work. Congratulations, folks. We just went through the entire first law of thermodynamics. Class dismissed. No, that was a joke. It was a joke. Don't turn off the video. Don't turn off the video. Um, or the webcam, whatever. But this is the first law of thermodynamics. Energy is going to be exchanged, and we're going to specifically be looking at energy exchange happening with respect to heat and work. So let's go back to those definitions of systems that we talked about in the previous video. So we talked about an isolated system. Isolated systems were cool because no exchange of energy, no exchange of matter, right? Like we had the, the sample and that's it. It ain't nothing's interacting with it. The system and the surroundings are not exchanging anything. Well, if they're not exchanging anything, is the internal energy of the system going to be able to change? No, because we just said it's Q plus W, and if Q is equal to zero and W is equal to zero, then the internal energy change for an isolated system is going to be zero. So obviously these are really boring <laughs> because if it's always like, what's the energy change here? Well, there was no energy change. Zero, the answer is zero. I don't know about you, but always coming up with the answer of zero is boring. Um... You can't exchange energy, you can't exchange work. So how could we make this a little bit more exciting? <laughs> because you're like, wait, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> one thing we could possibly do with an isolated system is actually allow the heat and the work values to change but if they are going to change, their magnitudes have to be equal and their signs have to be opposite. So that is to say, if there is going to be an energy change uh, in terms of heat, then you have to be able to gain that exact same amount of energy uh, in the form of work into that system. So if you think about that delta U equals Q plus W, if Q is equal to four joules and W is equal to negative four joules, four plus negative four equals zero, congratulations, you still have no change in your energy overall. Still pretty boring, just a little bit more exciting. Closed systems, that's gonna be where th the excitement comes into play. Um, before we leave uh, and start talking about closed systems, let's, I tried to make this point earlier, but I don't know how well it uh, actually went. We are going to be able to use the numeric sign value of uh, heat, work, and delta U to be able to figure out if energy is entering or leaving our systems. So the negatives that you're gonna be getting um, are actually important. So I know that sometimes we've said like, how do you have a negative mass? Well, you can have a negative energy, and it's not that the energy is disappearing. It's telling you the flow, the direction in which the energy is going. Um, so that's so the negatives now do become very important, and the negatives are going to have different language associated with them. Um, so, for example, uh, if we have a positive on an energy value, we're saying that energy is entering our system. So a positive Q, a positive heat, is saying heat is, and the energy in the form of heat is entering our system. Because remember the last video we said you can't have heat entering the system. Yes, yes, yes. But we can have energy in the form of like via heat, uh, in the form of heat entering into a system. This would give us a positive Q value. So Heat's absorbed by our system, Q is gonna be greater than zero. Similarly, work. If work is done on a system, so think about that compression again, right? So the external, the surroundings are compressing a gas. Now we have a value of work that's going to be greater than zero. 
Um, and so this is where work done on a system is that done on, that, that red word there on, is a key to you that the work value will be a positive number. So you can imagine a sentence that says something like uh, 15, joules of uh, 15 joules of work are done on a system. Well, that tells you in the math problem, then you need to be saying work equals positive, write out the positive for your own sakes, positive 15 joules. It'll like, I know that you think it's redundant to put the positive and the negative for those uh, units and for those numeric values. I'm telling you right now, until you get good at this, it's worth it to put the positive or the negative. If we have energy leaving a system, we're gonna give that a negative sign for any of those numeric values. So heat is being released by a system. So heat going from the system to the surroundings. We're going to say Q has a negative value. If work is being done by a system, now the system is expanding, right? Now the work value will be negative. Um, a classic example of work being done by a system is airbag deployment. So if you've ever uh, had the unfortunate situation where you've had airbags deployed um, in an auto accident, if the system is the chemicals involved in the actual uh, expansion of the airbag itself, um, those chemicals are the system the surroundings are everything else, including you. Work is being done onto you. So work is being transferred uh, from the system, in, or I'm sorry, energy in the form of work is being transferred from those chemicals in that process of expansion into you to keep you in place, or theoretically in place. So, classic example of the kinds of terminology that you're going to see in one of these uh, internal energy problems. So a gas does 135 joules of work while expanding. At the same time, it absorbs 156 joules of heat. What is the change in the internal energy? So the first thing that you're gonna to want to do to be able to work through these problems is like I said, you're going to need to assign values uh, or assign values and signs to work and heat. So if we look up in the very first sentence, it explicitly tells us that we've got 135 joules of work. So our W here is gonna be equaling 135 joules. The Part of the sentence, though, where it says expanding is going to tell us whether that is a positive 135 joules or a negative 135 joules. So based off of that expanding, we have to pause and we have to say, like, if nothing else, whip out that thesaurus, like I mentioned earlier. What does it, what, the, what are other terms that are, or what does expanding mean? What are other words that we can use in place of expanding that mean the same thing? that relate us back to our thermodynamic definitions. So if the system is expanding, the system is doing work on the surroundings. Because the system, the gas is our system, is expanding out, would we get a negative or a positive? So at this point, go ahead, take five seconds, write down whether you think it's negative or positive. This is really, really thrilling YouTube content. In case you forgot, we could go back to our definitions here. So if work is being done by a system, by a system is the same thing as saying a system is expanding. So our work should have a negative sign. Oops. What about Q? 
So it's absorbing energy. The system is taking energy into it in the form of heat. So would we have Q as being a positive or a negative? Take five seconds. I have no idea how much time passed. I'm assuming it's been five seconds. So I don't have a countdown timer running here. So if we think through it, heat is being absorbed. That word absorbed is the key to tell us that we have a positive sign for Q. Because absorb, you're taking into the system. The opposite of, of absorption is being released. If you are releasing from the system out to the surroundings, then we would have a negative heat. But since we're absorbing it in, we're taking it in. You can really, truly do like these kinds of hand things with yourself to help you figure out which direction things are going. And if you consider yourself always as the system, say, am I bringing it into me or am I taking it out of me? Um, that is actually kind of helpful uh, when you're starting to get the hang of this. Like we talked about with work, work is done by the system, so it's gonna get a negative value. So we can then pull up our equation for the change of internal energy. We plug in our value of Q, we plug in our value of W, do not forget the signs, oops, and you end up with your final answer. Okay, we've just got a fistful more uh, definitions and then we're gonna be uh, done with the video for today. So let's talk quickly about um, heats of reaction